and welcome to the Disruptive Innovation Festival 2016. Today we're discussing the topic of regenerative cities and why it is such a hot topic today. 2014 was the first time in recorded history that more, that more people were living in cities than in urban areas. 80% of our carbon emissions are produced by cities and 75% of our resource cons consumption comes from cities. Continued population growth and urbanisation are projected to add 2.5 billion people to the urban areas by 2050. And this leaves us with two key questions. How are they going to live and where are they going to live? Hello, my name is Jules and I'm joined today here in the studio by Sham Rankuma, who is Knowledge and Innovation Manager at Circle Economy. And I'm joined online by Melanie Nutter, who is former Director of San Francisco Department of Environment and now Principal at Nutter Consultancy. For those of you that have recognised some of those statistics that I just mentioned, might have watched Melanie's TEDx talk. And you can find out more about her work on her website, Nutter Consultancy, and also um, Sham's work at Circle Economy with the wealth of experience that they have working directly with cities and specifically with the city of Amsterdam, which we'll be hearing more about in this session today. So welcome to you both. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Great. So we're going to kick off the session with just a, a broad question to hear some of the surprising facts that have come up in your work today. So what are the, the big challenges that arose that you maybe weren't anticipating? And uh, what were the maybe positive impacts of some of your work that you, know, you weren't able to predict from the outset? So Melanie, if you could kick us off with that one, please. Sure. Well, and um... Hi, Jules and Sean. Thank you. It's really great to be here at the DIFF Festival. I'm looking forward to our discussion today to talk about regenerative cities and um, really what we can do to see a better future for our urban residents. Um, so in terms of the initial question of what are some of the challenges that I faced when I worked as director of Department of the Environment for the city and county of San Francisco, um, I'll start first with a couple of things that worked, which is the city of San Francisco has a couple of decades of success around um, becoming more environmental and becoming greener, um, which I really do think it translates into being regenerative. And a couple of the areas where we had success in San Francisco were, was, um, first of all, we had a lot of support from our political leaders. So that is something that in the city and county of San Francisco that has really helped to drive change is by having leadership at the top. Um, the second thing is the city and county of San Francisco has really focused on implementing policies and mandates to drive local change. And when I talk about being greener and more successful in the city, that is also very connected to um, looking at job creation and economic development in the city. So those two things are not separate. Those are definitely connected in terms of the programs and policies that were put in place. Um, so there's a number of other successes that I can talk about um, as we continue the conversation. But I would say really one of the challenges that I saw at the local level is um, around engaging citizens and helping citizens understand um, and participate in making the city more regenerative, whether it's recycling and composting, whether it's making a choice about mobility and how they're going to get around the city. Um, so one of the, the challenges but opportunities was how to engage the population and citizens, which I would love to talk more about today. Thank you. Sean. Yeah, I, um, I agree with, uh, with some of Melanie's points in terms of the challenges. So at Circle Economy, we have a, um, a program to really work with cities to enable them to become more circular and more regenerative. And uh, when we started off, uh, our first city was the city of Amsterdam. And they really had some of the kind of questions that, that Melanie described. How can we create economic growth through the circular economy, but also enable local job creation, um, reduced environmental footprint, et cetera? 
And um, what, we, what we saw is that we kind of started from a standpoint of, of data, so really analyzing all the different data streams within the city. And one of the challenges was there, there isn't so much data structured in the way that, that you'd want it uh, to, to do that kind of analysis. So we spent a lot of time just bringing in different sources and trying to piece together um, a, a story for the city. And <clears throat> we were able to kind of provide them with a set of recommendations. Um, but we learned from that assignment and what we've been doing in subsequent uh, work with cities is really starting from the standpoint of um, the city's aspirations and, and kind of where, do, where does a city want to go, where, does, where do its citizens want to go, where do the businesses want to kind of achieve in terms of the future vision. And um, when we did a project with Glasgow with that starting point, it actually worked out really well. Um, the city was very engaged and involved in the whole effort. Um, and we also worked with the uh, Chamber of Commerce as well. So we really got the business community uh, involved in that project. And there was a lot of positive response in terms of understanding what the kind of vision is in terms of how regenerative the city wants to be and what role businesses and citizens can play in that. Thank you. And when, when you're speaking, it's making me think about the, the kind of um, the tension that is pulled between short-term success and long-term success. And quite often when we're talking to citizens and engaging citizens and they feel that sense of participation, um, they want to see some direct impact of that. And, and, and at a policy level as well with, with political cycles, quite often there is a, a need for short-term um, success to be demonstrated. But I guess quite a lot of what you're both trying to implement with your work is around longer term, um, um, more resilient uh, res cities. So how can you give some examples, uh, maybe Sham to kick us off, of, of how you've been able to fulfill some short term success stories to build up that confidence level, but then also have that capability of, of driving towards long term resilience? Yeah, of course. Um, so I can uh, show some some examples of what we did from the perspective of looking at a system uh, within, within the city of Amsterdam and also within Glasgow. <clears throat> so really what we, what we tried to do with the short-term successes was first lay out sort of a, an overview of what is possible in the city um, in terms of a vision for the future <clears throat> and how different elements can, can be plugged in in order to enable the city to be more regenerative. So who are the different actors that are involved? What are the different ways that flows can be, can be cycled? And, and, you know, we did the same thing in, in Glasgow as well, specifically for food and beverages. And it really provides an overview of, of how cities can think both in the short term and the long term in terms of what they can do immediately in terms of pilot projects or initiatives and what they can do uh, in the future in terms of ways to develop their, their five-year plan or the long-term strategy. And um, we organized different workshops uh, in Glasgow uh, around this kind of image and this kind of visual. And what was really inspiring was to see how um, the city and, and different companies as part of that workshop really started engaging in it and, and planning for different pilot projects and different experiments that they could test out to implement some of these strategies, um, at least for the short term, to test out uh, how that would kind of look, uh, uh, at least initially, and how that can be potentially scaled up if it's successful. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Melanie, how about yourself? So I think um, I think these are all really great points about how um, cities really do need the long term goal and vision to be able to then chart a course for how to get there. And what are some of the incremental shorter term successes and wins um, that need to happen to achieve that longer term goal? And there is sometimes a tension between the two, but both are necessary. I would just say San Francisco, um, I think, is a great example where um, our policymakers did set a number of ambitious longer term goals as it relates again to becoming more sustainable. Um, one is to reduce carbon emissions by 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. That is um, a goal that the city set. But of course, that wasn't put in place with a plan, um, with incremental targets. That's really where the community and business leaders and other sectors come in to really chart a course for how to get there. I think another one of those um, longer term ambitious goals, which is now right around the corner, but um, a number of years ago, the city did set a goal of achieving zero waste by 2020. And um, again, that was a policy, that was a, not a policy mandate, but a, an ambitious 
um, audacious goal that the city said we want to get there. But in order to take those incremental steps towards getting to zero waste, a lot has needed to happen for engaging citizens and businesses and setting those near term targets to be able to achieve that goal. Thanks. Um, I personally am quite a visual visual thinker as well, and I, I, I very much enjoy having uh, a, what is essentially quite a complex system, like a city, mapped out visually. Uh, and I think some of the um, diagrams that Sham just shared with us, the, they do that quite well. They kind of use what you know, what I see is more of an academic diagram, like a Sankey diagram, where you have all of these different flows quite comprehensively mapped out, but then simplified so that it's a little bit more intuitive when you look at it to understand what's actually going on within that, that quite complex system like a city. Um, have you both got examples of the, the implications? Because Melanie, when you were just talking there, you were talking about setting this overarching vision, which is so important for that longer term goal, but then, the implementation of that involves many, many different stakeholders, and the, you know the citizens quite often um, need those tangible ways of understanding the, the implications of, of what their actions can have on that wider system. Um, are there any other examples for uh, other people who enjoy that visual aid um, of the use of the visual in order to help people get that visibility, that mental model in their head of, of what the city could and should look like? Um, maybe Melanie, if you've got some pieces on that. Well, what I, what that actually brings to mind is um, a, a new program in San Francisco, which is it's actually a prototyping festival along Market Street, which is the central um, business corridor street in the city and county of San Francisco. And the planning department, along with a number of other stakeholders, um, essentially activate Market Street in a way that brings Market Street to life. And they have a number of different um, actual visual projects and programs that they bring to the street where citizens can interact with it. So as an example, right outside um, my office along Market Street, they built an urban forest. And it was something that they brought in, brought in the trees, um, brought in the people to put it together as a way to sort of bring to life um, um, biodiversity and bringing more greening to the city. So I think that that's, it's sort of a tactical way to engage citizens. Um, that was one of the things that came to mind when you were talking about really how to make it more visual and how to bring these concepts to life. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, and actually um, <clears throat> what uh, uh, Amsterdam started in terms of a program, it was actually inspired by a program that was run in, in San Francisco uh, called Startup in Residence. And it's really, <clears throat> in terms of citizen engagement, really trying to take some of those visual elements and different strategies and, and trying to develop challenges for citizens to kind of solve. Um, and it kind of brought, it, brought these more systems level complex ideas down to specific projects or, or problems that the city has and wants solutions for. And it really sparks citizens to kind of be engaged and develop those kinds of solutions. And the city in general has been great about um, providing room for experimentation. Uh, so throughout the city, uh, there's initiatives like uh, De Koeville in, in the north of Amsterdam, where it's sort of a, a closed loop uh, um, office space, where um, they're trying to essentially use reusable elements, compostable toilets, renewable energy, to create a kind of self-sufficient office park and self-sufficient uh, neighborhood. Um, there's also examples of, of the city trying to uh, repurpose old buildings. Um, the, the most recent addition is the sort of Amsterdam Tower. It used to be the headquarters for, uh, for Shell, and the entire building has now been renovated and is, is being utilized as um, office space for startups and entrepreneurs, et cetera. Um, and you can find examples like this uh, throughout the city, and I think, as Melanie said, it's, it's really key that the, the city kind of provides these spaces for experimentation uh, in order for citizens to see tangibly how these ideas can come alive. Thanks. Um, and when you're speaking there, it's making me think of these flows, these feedback loops that we're trying to create in cities. Cities are aggregators of materials uh, and information, and they bring together um, a lot of these uh, these different flows. And I and I think a lot of this terminology around regenerative cities is how those 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 materials can be effectively used within that city context. Um, and you just use that term, the, the kind of closed loop system. Um, and for me, that term is, is, it invokes a frame of, of a kind of pipe, a single pipe, a, a one feedback loop that moves within a system. 
but really are we talking more about an ecosystem where there is multiple scale of use of a material and you you mentioned there about entrepreneurs and the and the need for that more ground up context based um, innovation that comes from the city itself. Um, can you give some examples of, of or maybe your opinion around the use of the term closed loop in a, in a city context and, um, and some examples of where, where it's played out? Shall yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think uh, a lot of people think uh, closed loop in terms of taking streams and putting it back into a, a singular process. but. Um, there's many opportunities for, for I guess, cascading would be, would be the term to use. Um, opportunities to see what kind of valuable uses there are for a particular stream uh, beyond just the, the output that it came out of, uh, of a process that it came out of. Um, so <clears throat> for the, the city of, uh, of Brussels, for example, uh, we looked into how the city could more effectively use the, the natural water cycle. Um, and I, I can show you some examples of how <clears throat> we kind of recommended that the city use um, different ways to utilize <clears throat> water streams coming into the city. So it, it comes from kind of rainwater, from uh, streams uh, up, uphill. Um, and actually, here it is. So we looked at how the city can use, uh, can act as a sponge for water in different ways. Um, so how can the city utilize it for, for power through, through hydropower? How can it be used for, for cooling purposes? within the city? Um, how can water be retained in, in plazas and fountains before it enters a sewer system and, and be used for irrigation, et cetera? Uh, how can it be captured for use uh, for, for drinking and, and rainwater? And at the very end, uh, once it does enter the sewer system, how can it be treated and used for different purposes there? So there's multiple uses, I think, for um, a particular stream or any stream uh, within a city. And it's, it's interesting to see how the city kind of creatively comes up with different ideas and, and allows for experimentation to, to use all that. Thank you. Melanie, did you have any thoughts on that piece particularly? Yeah, and I do think that's a great example. Um, I would say a couple of additional examples around um, the thinking and, and sort of tactically how a closed loop may work in a city. Um, there's two examples I want to give from San Francisco. One is around the composting program that the city has. Um, back in um, 2009, the city passed an ordinance that required recycling and composting in um, for, for residents and businesses in the city. And it was one of the first of its kind to say it's required to actually have recycling or composting service. This, of course, was again in service of meeting the um, zero waste goal by 2020. But the exciting part about the composting program is it was really the first urban area in the US that um, committed to a citywide composting program. And when the program first started, um, Recology, which is the private sector partner working with the city, was um, collecting about 400 tons per day of compost. Um, once the city did a huge outreach and education campaign and engaged citizens and businesses, that went up to about 600 tons per day. And the compost that's collected, the, the yard, um, yard trimmings and food waste is taken to a facility that's about 55 miles outside of San Francisco and turned into fertilizer for agricultural lands and vineyards that are in the Bay Area. So it really is um, an excellent way to, I think, describe this sort of closed loop system of capturing those resources and putting them back to work in and around the area. The second um, example is a construction and demolition ordinance that the city has, which requires that 75% of any materials that are coming off of a construction site are either reused or repurposed. Um, and that is one way that also has really helped the city get towards the zero waste goal. But those are two, I think, tactical examples for this closed loop system. I would say the challenge for especially practitioners on the city side is how to weave those tactical programs into this larger vision around creating a regenerative city, a circular economy, um, and how to bring that all together for policymakers and for the public to describe how those systems work together. Thank you. And I think we'll come on to the topic of demolition versus deconstruction in just a minute. But before then, I'd like to um, come to uh, hear a little bit about what else is going on in the city's scape um, here at the Disruptive Innovation Festival over the next few days. And my colleague Hugh is here to tell us more about that. Hi, if you found this discussion fascinating so far, the following three sessions will be right up your street. First, 
Maya and Ash from our Governments and Cities team are going to welcome you to, the, to a circular city, a city that thrives on circular business models to overcome the increasing pressure of high density population in urban environments. Next, same time, the following day, we will take a step inside a circular building where the Rockstar team from AMS and TU Delft will be waxing lyrical about circular kitchens and HVAC, looking at how new ownership models will facilitate these products staying in the inner loops. Taking a step back outside with Ash, Ashima, we, she will be providing some highlights from the Circular Economy European Summit, talking about how increased mobile technology and increased urban density are favouring new business models which favour access over ownership, reverse logistics and collaborative platforms. So as Aerosmith famously said, walk this way. And be there or be square. But do not forget to tweet on hashtag ThinkDiff or register for your MyDiff account before Friday. Back to you, Jules. Thanks very much, Hugh. I enjoyed that. And um, just before we go back to this discussion, I wanted to highlight that there are this one of five interactive graphics that we've set up, particularly around this topic of, of cities. Uh, you can access this on the you can access this on the uh, session page. Um, if you go to the bottom of the page, you can click on the interactive graphic and find out more. So just click in and be part of the conversation. You can hear what other people are saying. You can um, contribute to the dialogue. You can challenge, have a debate, have a discussion. This is about participation uh, and it's about joining the conversation with the DIFF um, audience. You get the picture. So, um, for those of you who want to um, get get in touch with uh, the rest of the audience, um, just click on that interactive graphic graphic set. So, um, if I come back to this conversation, and I want to pick up on this point around around construction because it's such a big part of the development of cities as the um, people within them, uh, the population grows. Um, and one of the 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 case studies that I've used in the past is around this point of demolition and, de and deconstruction. And there are some good examples out there of organizations who are actually very, um, very carefully deconstructing buildings in order to retain the material, uh, the tip materials within them at a higher value, the steels, the woods, the concretes, and have them used more effectively um, and at a higher value and re-entering the market. Um, and a, a good example of that is, is steel itself. And I think that often when you do go for a normal demolition process, that quality of the steel is lost. Um, if you, Sham, if we could start with you with some of your examples of what this looks like. Yeah, of course. There's actually um, <clears throat> a startup uh, in, in Amsterdam called uh, Stone Cycling. And uh, what they do is they is essentially um, take uh, uh, construction waste uh, and they make new sort of bricks and building materials out of it. Um, and that's a great example of how kind of uh, um, waste from, from deconstruction or, or demolition can be reused uh, essentially uh, for the purposes of new construction. There's also a, another one called uh, Slim Breaker, and that essentially takes um, concrete uh, from demolition or, or even deconstruction, and uh, it goes through a process where it gets separated into all the different components that, that make up the concrete. So you have essentially after the process a pile of sand, a pile of gravel, a pile of, of other materials. Um, so it essentially kind of separates uh, these construction materials back into their constituent uh, components, which can then be processed again and, and reused uh, for, for new construction. Um, and I think we were talking earlier about uh, the building in, in Japan. I think there's a cool YouTube video uh, of it where essentially the building is taken down floor by floor. So there's a lot of care taken in how do you uh, uh, deconstruct it and, and extract all the materials at, at high value as possible. Yeah, and 
And I think one of the points um, I was raising there that I wasn't sure about is that that sounds like it's a, 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 good, a good use, a better use of material flows, but then it, it creates a logistics issue because you've then got to store, you've got to um, you know, sort all of the different materials that you're getting from that um, deconstruction process. And you had a, an, an example of where that's been um, a, a solution around that in Amsterdam. Yeah, that's right. So for, for Amsterdam, when we proposed the kind of idea of, of deconstruction, uh, we also proposed that the city should look into um, finding ways to store those materials in kind of material marketplaces. Uh, so we actually identified a few areas in the city where these materials can be almost temporarily stored. And what you can do with that is you can also combine it with, for example, an online marketplace. So you essentially create um, a materials exchange uh, where deconstruction companies can get um, potentially more value from the materials that are recovered by storing them in these areas. And construction companies can then utilize um, these materials for new construction. And going back to, to what you mentioned about kind of diversity and, and different uses, um, it allows not only construction companies to use it, but any sort of entrepreneurs or home builders or other sort of actors within the city to kind of get access yeah. to those materials. It's nice because it operates at different scales, which if we took a living system analogy around ecosystems, you have that diversity of scales, which is a really great example. Yeah. Melanie, did you have anything to share on that point? Um, well, it's, it's always great to talk with other folks working in cities because cities love to steal ideas from each other. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, um, I loved hearing about that. And um, I'm actually not familiar with any of the organizations that are doing specific deconstruction work in San Francisco. I'm sure there's some, but it's certainly an idea that I would love to raise with some of my colleagues. Um, one thing I was going to add is there is a nonprofit in San Francisco called Building Resources, which is essentially a partner to the construction industry, whether it's residential or commercial. And a lot of the materials end up going to building resources to be put back into, um, into the building and construction process. So in that case, in San Francisco, there's a nonprofit partner. But I would love to learn more about um, who's doing deconstruction work in and around the Bay Area and, and how to do more of that. Thank you. Uh, there's a question that's come in from Rene online that um, is the point around trust and transparency and the importance of it in stakeholder management around resources um, and to the success in, uh, of engaging in, in regenerative cities. So uh, do either of you have examples um, uh, of, of the, this, the importance of trust and transparency um, uh, in, order, in order to get that engagement from the different stakeholder groups? Uh, Melody, maybe for you to kick off. Um, well, I think it's a great point. I mean, when you're thinking about engaging the citizens, businesses, other stakeholders, um, in order for there to be substantive and significant participation, there does have to be that trust um, and also transparency. And I think um, it brings to mind um, how you can really report on and use data to show how any actions that are taking are making an impact, however small. So I think whether it's being able to provide um, information back to a business or to a home about the impact that they've made from recycling or composting, whether it's about using data um, to be able to show how any mobility choices that they're making are helping to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, I, one, one example it does bring to mind is, um, and I'm not, I would love to hear what you think about this, is there's a, a bicycle counter along Market Street that shows um, with every biker that goes by how many people actually rode their bike into the downtown area. And I think that sort of also builds a community feeling where there's an individual on their bike, but knowing they're part of 2,000 or 3,000 people or 5,000 people who, who chose a different mode to get into downtown, and does that help to spur that um, choice again? So th those are my thoughts about trust and transparency. That's nice, and I think for me, it almost feels you bring in a, a gaming aspect to it then, because mm -hmm. they're getting that feedback around what else is going on, and you can have almost that competitive play um, piece comes in. Uh, Sham, did you have any bits on that? Yeah, just building off of that uh, kind of gamification in a way. Um, one thing that we're trying to, to do at Circle Economy is develop a sort of city dashboard. So how do you capture all the elements of a circular economy within a city and kind of create a benchmark uh, to other cities, particularly or especially to do that? How do you kind of uh, encourage cities to, to be more competitive against each other and see 
what are some best practices and others. And as Melanie said, uh, cities do love to kind of uh, play off of each other's ideas and, and build on them. So how do you get that uh, going in terms of transparency? Um, and then in, in to your point about trust, I think you know cities have uh, a unique role to play. Uh, as you mentioned, they are kind of this aggregator of resources, but they're also an aggregator of, of, of people and, and companies. Um, so they really can act as a catalyst to get some of these ideas rolling. <clears throat> and because they're sort of seen as this independent arbiter in many cases, um, you can really have them bring together various uh, actors within a, a supply chain or, or across industries uh, and really get them together to kind of experiment with different things. Um, and, and I think you know cities have that huge potential to do that in order to become a more regenerative city in the future. Thank you. There's a there's a, another question that's come in online from Twitter, um, asking around digital tools and how they can help create visual uh, data visualizations of the program. So that kind of uh, live feed uh, piece that you can actually start to understand. And I think it, it almost plays in a bit what you were saying there, Melanie, about the bikes and for people to get that real sense of um, uh, of connectivity with what their fellow city dwellers are doing. Are there other examples? And I know, Melanie, you've done a, lo a lot of work in the space of the use of digital technology. Maybe you can kick us off on, on this, particularly around this data visualization and then broad, more broadly around the use of digital tools to, to enable more smarter cities. Well, I think, as Sean was saying, I think um, a lot of cities are, are trying to figure out how to create dashboards that show data that's interesting and actionable and accessible to citizens and stakeholders and policymakers. And that's a, a huge challenge right now because, um, not to get into the weeds too much, but um, at the city level, a lot of the data that's collected by city agencies lives within that agency and can be very siloed. And it's hard to access and it may not be clean. And so when you're thinking about how to gather actionable, meaningful, up-to-date information um, and how to display it, cities have a real challenge in figuring that out. So that's I will just say that that's a current challenge that a lot of cities are working on. But a really specific example um, that I think lends itself more to using visualization for engaging citizens on these topics. Um, I'm working on a project right now with um, FEMA and an organization called Climate Access in San Francisco to put digital viewfinders along the waterfront to help to visualize future sea level rise. So it's an interesting way to use digital tools and technology to engage an, a resident or a tourist um, along the waterfront to see what potential sea level rise could be in the future and then see if that moves their opinion about what the city should do about it and what they should personally do. So that's one specific example that I think is a way of using digital visualization for engagement. Yeah, and, and I think building off of Melanie's point about, about data, um, one of the cool things that's starting to happen now, especially with technology becoming so prevalent um, and sensors actually becoming so cheap, is that there are a lot of uh, almost citizen initiatives to start measuring things within the city. Um, in Amsterdam, there's, there's something called the Amsterdam Smart Citizen Lab, where essentially uh, volunteers will come together and build sensors to test different things like air quality, water quality, noise levels, uh, pollution levels, uh, traffic congestion, uh, even bumpiness of roads, um, just to kind of get more transparency in terms of how they can contribute to these different challenges and get a better understanding of the city that they live in. Um, and it's really cool to see kind of how uh, technology incorporated in, in smart ways can engage both the citizen but also provide these kinds, this, the kind of information that, that cities need uh, in order to develop the right infrastructure and advance in the future. Um, I think there's an example in Sao Paulo of something that they enabled called My Fun City. And it's essentially like a digital um, uh, dashboard uh, for the city to see what is the kind of <clears throat> level of conversation uh, amongst the citizens. So what are the key issues or key challenges that they're facing? Uh, in which neighborhoods are these issues happening? Uh, what kind of demographics are, are talking about these different issues? So it really gives kind of a, a bottom-up insight into what's happening uh, on the ground, and it allows cities to, to respond to that and react to that more effectively. Thank you. Uh, there's another question on Twitter, which I, th I think kind of plays into this a bit around the kind of um, the position of, of power within cities, uh, and who, who is actually gonna be leading this change? And, I, and, and I've, it feels a bit like this is, um, you know, it's not a kind of, um, 
not to polarize this as being it's it's one group or another um, but the the it, the question is who is in the position of power to lead this change in cities and should we embrace stronger decision making powers for individual cities around key issues charm if you kick us off uh, yeah I, th I think um, with with cities it's important that they obviously set the direction in, in the future um, movement towards how they how they want to go but I think it's important that they bring along uh, the citizens and and the kind of constituents of the city on board with this journey um, I think it's it's hard for them to have take a very heavy hand mm -hmm. in terms of uh, how the city should look in the future because in a way the city is composed of its different citizens so without the sort of willingness of the companies and the willingness of the citizens and the kind of mutual agreement in terms of how the city should should move towards the future it's hard to really kind of move in that direction and get everyone on board um, I'm going to stop you there yeah. so I'm going to try because we've got quite a few questions coming in so sure. we're going to keep keep the responses quite short so I can try and cover them all Melanie did you have a piece on that around the division of power in cities and, and where where leadership comes from um, well, very briefly, I think there is a role for pretty much every stakeholder play, to play in seeing this change. Certainly policymakers, certainly agency heads. Um, I do think that there's also a role for um, raising awareness and doing education within city agencies that are operating a lot of the systems, not just the leaders, but the implementers. Um, and then certainly the business community being able to bring new solutions to bear so policymakers know what's possible. Yeah, thank you. Um, and there's a question um, that's posted around the actual term regenerative cities. Um, it's, you know, we have sustainable cities, smart cities, green cities, uh, regenerative cities, circular cities, so many different terms out there. Can, can you both give an opinion on whether you think the diversity of terms is, is helpful or whether you actually think we need to be consolidating these and creating more consistency in our use of language when it comes to the future of cities? Uh, Melanie. Um, very briefly, I, I would say that I do think it's confusing. I think a lot of these terms um, help to paint a picture um, generally for what we're working to achieve. But if you ask, again, some a practitioner in a city, what's different between a smart, regenerative, resilient, sustainable, economically thriving city, how do you describe that in a pithy way where um, we all know what we're talking about? So I would say that there really is a need to consolidate terms and language to be a little bit more focused. And, and what's your pithy description <laughs> of a regenerative city? <laughs> um, my pithy description of a regenerative city um, I would say it's a city that essentially um, thinks about the resources that it's taking in and spending as well as expending and finding a balance between the two. So not having the inputs or the outputs for resources in cities being out of balance. That would be my brief description. Thank you. John? And I, I agree as well that um, you have all these different terms out there uh, in terms of how do you describe cities uh, in this context, whether it's circular, regenerative, et cetera. And when you boil it down, it's, it's all essentially, um, at, at its fundamental level, very similar. Uh, so I think, I think some commonality or co common understanding of what are the aspects um, of what we mean by a regenerative city or a circular city, what are the kind of key elements uh, that describe th these kinds of cities, would be helpful, uh, especially as a way for cities to better understand what are the steps that they should be taking or what are the areas that they should be focusing on uh, in order to achieve that state. And I think if you have too many different definitions, it's hard for them to wrap their minds around, you know, do we call ourselves a circular city or a regenerative one? And when fundamentally they're probably very similar. Thanks. And uh, what we've a uh, word that's been used a lot in this session is is creating a vision around around cities. Um, and there's a there's a question that asks around this point of. So if we know what we're against, we know what's going wrong in cities, what are we actually for and what does good look like in cities? And, and a longer term view on that um, from you both would be great. So Melanie, if you could just give us, uh, tell us a little bit of a story about what your, your archetypal city in the future would actually look like. So that's, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I would start with putting the citizens and people first. And so building a city and an urban environment where 
um, the residents, um, all residents have equal access to open space, to clean air, to clean water, um, to sustainable, affordable housing. Um, so I think putting citizens first and then building infrastructure and systems around creating a sustainable, healthy, happy quality of life for citizens is um, would be, I think, the vision. And then you figure out it's not technology driven, it's not um, data driven, it's not infrastructure driven. All of those tools are in service of making the city better for its citizens. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. John? I think um, <clears throat> in terms of like how these cities can, can be in the future, they, they really can focus on a few different aspects. So how do they kind of prioritize regenerative resources or, or resources within their kind of local uh, area as much as possible? Uh, what extent can they preserve and ex extend existing assets and infrastructure um, and, and utilize that to the maximum extent possible? To what extent can they kind of reuse waste streams, what they now consider waste? How can they kind of incorporate it back into the city? Uh, can they design better for the future, their neighborhoods, the urban, urban planning aspects? Um, to what extent can they increase collaboration between businesses, between citizens, et cetera? And also, how do they kind of provide services to the city? Um, there's, there's examples out there of very different models that focus on, as Melanie mentioned, what is the kind of core need for the citizen uh, instead of taking a more uh, 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 supply-driven aspect. Yeah. Um, so how do you meet the demands of the citizen? And then lastly, how do you incorporate kind of digital technology and digital elements to smartly utilize resources within the city? Uh, I think all of those can come together to create essentially a regenerative circular city. Thank you. I can see that we've got um, a really thriving online community and we can't get to all your questions uh, today for this session because we're, we're drawing to a close. I'd like to just ask you both to give a, a summary point really, um, uh, mainly around where, where people can find out more um, and, and, and maybe just a snippet uh, about you know, what, what it is that you're most excited about in your, in your kind of immediate work, work at the moment. So where can they find out more and what's really exciting you about the, um, the, the, the progress made in cities, Sham? So uh, our, our work can be found on our website, www.circleeconomy uh, dash, circle dash economy com, and there's a there's a link to a, a sort of cities program page, where they can learn more about our work there. And what's really exciting is the the kind of traction that's being started with with cities. Um, you know, we started with Amsterdam and Glasgow, and we've gotten huge amounts of interest uh, among cities all over the world. So it's great to see uh, city managers and, and mayors, etc., and city leaders really thinking about the circular economy and how they could move their cities towards this this ideal. So Thank it's you. exciting to see. Over to you, Melanie. Great, and I'll just say a couple of resources. Um, one is our website, nutterconsulting.net, um, which has more information about the consulting projects we're working on in the um, circular economy, sustainability, and smart city space. Um, I'll also mention the Department of the Environment website is sfenvironment.org. So that's more information about um, the department that I used to run that's doing a lot of the work in San Francisco. And then lastly, um, one of the resource is a new entity called Super Public in San Francisco, um, which is a really interesting incubator bringing city officials, business leaders, and academia together to look at innovative solutions, um, some of them in this space and some outside the space, but another really great resource for folks. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, thank you uh, for our online audience for your questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them, but it's great to see so many coming in. Do visit the interactive graphic to be part of that conversation and, um, and tune in to those sessions that Hugh mentioned that we've still got coming up in the last few days of DIFF. Um, also, set up your own MyDIF account if you want to uh, catch up on some of the over 200 sessions of, of great rich content that's been uh, made available to you for a limited period of time, so don't miss um, that opportunity. I'd like to thank both of our speakers today. Um, it was a, a really rich conversation and I very much enjoyed it. Um, it was a pleasure to be able to run the session with you. Um, and just to mention, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has a circular cities network which is established uh, internationally to create collaboration across a number of cities um, to highlight the potential in this space and also the um, examples of how this is playing out in practice. So stay tuned on the Circulate News website to find out more about what's going on in that cities network. 
Uh, but for now, it's over and out here from the Diff Studio. Thanks.